Thanks, John. Thank you very much uh, for providing me the opportunity of being with you here tonight. It's nice to be back in Perth. It's the first time I've spoken at the uh, University of, of Western Australia. Uh, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes with you tonight. And we're going to go on a journey around the world. We're going to start in the West, head over to the East, via the Middle East. And then we're going to have about five minutes of uh, questions at the end. And then John, I think, very, uh, very thoughtfully has said you can all have a break and kind of wander off somewhere and have a few drinks, hopefully. Uh, each and every single one of us here tonight is witness, in my view, to what I've described now for several years as the new reality. Each and every single one of us in this room tonight. And the new reality is a very, very simple one. That is that the world is now increasingly divided between those nations that are sub-merging and those nations that are emerging. Now, most of us in this room have been raised in a world in the post-war period where we've described the world as being either developed or advanced, as distinct from developing or emerging. I think the terms advanced and developed are now becoming somewhat redundant, if not meaningless. I think we now have to understand there are certain nations that could only be described as actually submerging, because they're submerging beneath a mountain of debt. And the submerging nations, in my view, will spend less and save more, and the emerging nations will spend more and save less. It really is as simple as that. Now, most of you know the people in my profession, I've been in the investment industry for 27 years, and I've loved every minute of it. I absolutely love it. But as you know, we, uh, we have a great uh, ability to overcomplicate things and use, manipulate, and twist statistics to best serve our purpose at any given moment in time. And statistics, if tortured sufficiently, will confess to anything. So I think it's important that we keep it as simple as that. Now, a word of caution before we embark on our, our journey around the world. As I said, we're going to start in the submerging world. And the first part of my discussion with you tonight is absolutely terrifying. It's horrifying, it's sobering, and anyone with a nervous disposition should leave right now. It really is scary stuff. But I do assure you that once we've passed through the submerging world and crossed the Great Divide, you can relax and enjoy the ride. But we have to get this bit out of the way. It's rather sad, and everything I'm about to tell you or show you, each of you know already but it is a central part of the new reality and the story I've been telling now for many, many years. This is a deliberate pause. I'm going to go to the back of the room, actually, just to see if I can see it myself. It's important that you actually have a really good look at this chart. I've never been to the back of one of these rooms. You can just about see it. What are we showing you there? I ask questions, by the way, throughout my, discussion, my presentations. So if anyone's thinking of nodding off, don't do it. Total debt, as divided by GDP. Total debt is comprised of what? Government debt, corporate debt, and household debt. We're talking, of course, about the United States of America. We commenced the data in about 1925. Most of you in this room will know that the period on the left side of that chart when debt to GDP in the United States reached a then historic high of 260%, preceded what event? The Great Depression. And for those of you with better eyesight than I, when you peer to the extreme top right corner, you will see that total debt in the United States of America reached 372%. And is now turning down. This is one of those uh, slides that the Wall Street marketing machine has kept from us for a very long period of time. It is what it is. I didn't make this up. I'm just representing reality. Let's take one component part of that pie, the debt pie. Commence the data in 1952 and profile US household debt. And here we bundle everything up. Mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, personal loans. 
not expressed as a ratio, it's expressed as an absolute number, and you can see quite clearly that America, the nation of shop till you drop, were a fairly frugal bunch in the 50s and 60s, and something happened. In the 80s, accelerating into the 90s, and really taking off exponentially in the new millennium. What happened in the United States of America? Why did household debt rise so sharply? I'll take that on notice. Any more? Credit cards? Baby boomers. This great nation of innovation gave birth to a Frankenstein-like creation, if not abomination. The Ninja Mortgage. Everyone familiar here with the Ninja Mortgage? Can anyone tell me what it stands for? No income, no job or assets required. In July 2005, I was in a hotel room in New York and I was flicking through one of those ghastly New York tabloids. I'm sure it was owned by Murdoch. In fact, it was. It was a half-page advertisement and it read as follows. No income, no job, personal bankruptcy, no problem, mortgages available 24 hours a day over the phone. And in fact, the reaction when I read that advertisement out at every single speech in 2005 and 2006 is exactly the the reaction I've just seen in this audience today in 2011. Believe it or not, that great nation of innovation gave birth to, as I said, that Frankenstein-like creation. And as a consequence, household debt rose exponentially. Please note, of course, for the first time in the post-war period that household debt on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis is now actually declining. The United States, the nation of shop till you drop, is doing what? Spending less and saving more. And that is part of the new reality. I'm not making those numbers up. That is what's happening in the United States of America today. And by the time, if you ever invite me back in years to come, I almost guarantee you that number will be even lower. So, let's now get through the really stressful part of the evening. Let's go country by country and talk about the countries that I have identified now for several years as being submerging nations. Who in this room has ever been to Iceland? Who cares about Iceland, really? Quite, come on, let's be honest. It's a nation of 320,000 people. What is this person talking about Iceland for? Oh my God, how long is he going to talk for tonight? 320,000 people. But Iceland, of course, made the headlines in 2010 for what reason? For the explosion of a volcano, which none of us can pronounce even to this day. Whereas, in fact, it was the implosion of the financial, economic, and banking system of Iceland that should have been the headline in every newspaper in the world because in 2008, just three banks, three banks in Iceland had combined assets equivalent to 13 times the GDP of Iceland. The rest, as they say, is history, leading the former prime minister of Iceland to make this statement to his 320,000 shell-shocked citizens of Reykjavik, say that after a few drinks, Citizens of Iceland, my advice to you tonight is go fishing. Because that is all we have left. Three banks destroyed the nation of Iceland. In fact, friends of mine now say I should no longer classify Iceland as a submerging nation. I should classify it in the sunk column. Let's cross to Ireland. And what's the difference between Iceland and Ireland? One letter. Guess what happened in Ireland? And I'm sure many of you have been to Ireland. I'm sure many of you have enjoyed the beautiful pubs, the beautiful people, the smiling faces of the Irish. Well, guess what happened in Ireland? Three banks. Three banks brought that beautiful nation crashing to its knees. Three banks that engaged in predatory and shameful lending practices brought Ireland crashing to its knees. Indeed, Ireland has, in essence, lost its sovereignty now to the bureaucrats in Brussels because of the shameful conduct of three banks. And I wonder where the chief executives of those three aforementioned banks are. Spending their vast bonuses on some beautiful beach somewhere in the world. Leaving behind them a trail of economic devastation. It's an extraordinary story. 
an extraordinary story. Tragically, Irish eyes are no longer smiling tonight. I told you this was going to be depressing. Shall we go to Greece? Or shall we just bypass Greece? Like every good Greek tragedy, we kind of know how it ends, we just don't know how long it takes. Is it not ironic that the birthplace of democracy, Athens, is where we see such terrible scenes of social unrest today? Because it was, of course, Greece who first put their hand up in May of 2010 and asked the European Union and the International Monetary Fund to provide them with 110 billion euros because they could no longer pay their bills. Because, of course, debt to GDP in Greece reached 150%. The rest, as they say, is history. We go to Portugal. No, Portugal's a fabulous place. Lots of great golf courses. But they took a bailout as well about nine months ago. You know about that. So we go to Spain. Well, the pain in Spain falls mainly upon the housing plane, with apologies to George Bernard Shaw. Can anyone tell me what the unemployment rate in Spain is today? 21%. Can anyone tell me what the youth unemployment rate, that is classified as anyone between the ages of 16 and 25, what the youth unemployment rate in Spain is today? 45%. Well done. 46 today, went up a percent over the week. 45, 46%. Absolutely stunning, staggering. Numbers that we've hardly ever seen before. We know, of course, that the construction bubble in Spain is going to go down in history. In fact, between 1996 and 2006, the Spanish built more homes than France, Germany, and Italy combined. Do we need to spend any time in the United States? We've, already, we've had enough of that, haven't we?